Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. My name is Daniel Waldron, and I'm very glad to be welcoming you to our webinar today, Impact at Risk, uh, Why Credit Risk Management Matters in Asset Finance. For those of you who may or may not know, the CGAP is the consultative group to assist the poor, is a research organization dedicated to research and advocacy on financial inclusion, and is supported by over 30 members and housed at the World Bank and has the privilege of hosting this webinar today. To cover some brief logistics at the start here, this is an audio broadcast, obviously, um, and attendees microphones will remain muted during the entire webinar session. If we are saying things that provoke a strong reaction from you, that's fantastic, but you'll have to ask the questions using your keyboard. Um, there will be multiple opportunities for questions and answers throughout the session. Just make sure you're typing those questions and submitting them using the Q&A function on the Zoom bar. And when you mark questions, make sure you do so for all panelists and attendees so everybody can see what you're asking. Uh, and just to forestall the inevitable questions, which we're happy about, uh, yes, a recording of this will be sent out to all attendees and will be made available on the website, as well as the technical guide itself, which will be sent out to everybody once it is published in the next coming weeks. This is an hour and a half long webinar, and I assure you, you do not want to miss a single minute of it. We'll spend the first 15 minutes covering the guide itself, and then we'll be getting into some key findings from it with risk management experts who are on the line. There'll be a chance for question and answer with those experts, and then we'll move into a discussion with two credit managers at actual asset finance companies, and we'll have some opportunity for a couple of questions and answers with them. And then we'll have a similar discussion with two investors in asset finance companies to find out what they look for when they're evaluating credit risk management. And similarly, we'll have a chance for a little bit of question and answer, and then I'll wrap up. To begin with, um, as I said, my name is Daniel Waldron, and I had the pleasure of managing much of this work for CGAP together with my colleagues here from 2018 through 2021. This is actually one of my final official functions as part of CGAP, as I recently began work as the head of insights at Acumen, which is a not-for-profit investor of patient capital. Uh, but for today, the CGAP team has graciously uh, allowed me to come back and present the results of this work, so I'll be wearing that hat uh, once again. Along with me today to present the guide and the findings in it are three incredible experts in risk management who I had the pleasure of working with on this project. Walter Tukahirwa is a credit risk management expert at Nestor Advisors, who also works as a consultant occasionally for organizations such as Frankfurt School. Walter has over 20 years of experience within East Africa and internationally in financial and treasury management, business strategy, financial accounting, um, and auditing. He has led financial institutions, he has managed uh, treasury operations at commercial banks and microfinance institutions, and he is based in Uganda. How are you today, Walter? I'm great, thanks Daniel for the introduction and uh, pleasure to be here. Uh, good evening, good day, good afternoon everyone. Thank you so much. Also on the line is Isaac Williams, who's the Director of Strategy and Business Development at IPC, which is a financial sector strategy and sustainability consulting firm. Isaac leads the firm's work on credit risk and portfolio management in the off-grid solar and emerging asset finance sector. Hi, Isaac. Hi, everyone. Good to be here. Thank you. And last but certainly not least, Holger Zeek is a senior risk management expert at the Frankfurt School of Finance and Management. Holger is a member of the Frankfurt School's Risk Management Competence Center, where he works with banks, microfinance institutions, last mile distributors, and asset finance companies all around the world, Eastern Europe, Southeast Asia, Africa, and Germany, on areas of risk management and all topics relevant for financial institutions. And he gets the prize for joining from the farthest away. He's calling in from Bishkek in Kyrgyzstan. Good evening to you, Holger. Yeah, thanks, Dan. Hello, great to be here. Welcome, everybody, and good evening from Bishkek. Thank you, sir. All right, let's get into it. You, whoever you are who's listening, um, are accessing this webinar through a physical asset that you or maybe your organization purchased. High quality tangible items such as your laptop or your smartphone or other assets such as sewing machines or motorcycles or water pumps are a central part of all of our daily lives. They're, it's sort of self obvious to say that. They allow us to travel, to work, to relax, to live. And empirically, asset ownership has been shown to help low-income households improve their productivity, increase their incomes, and enhance their quality of life. If you want to learn more about that, my colleague Sai Krishna Kumaraswamy has put out an excellent paper on their importance at CGAP. 
but how do poor households acquire assets? You know, in a country like Uganda, where 70% of the population lives on less than $3.20 a day, few households can afford to buy a motorcycle in cash. Um, even fewer can afford to buy something like a solar water pump. To acquire these assets, they need to be able to spread the payments out over time. And this means either saving up the money to buy something and then purchasing it, or acquiring it and paying for it over time plus interest. Our guide on asset finance covers the latter. When we say asset finance, we just are referring to loans or leases that let a borrower use an asset while paying for it over time. And this type of credit is rapidly on the rise in Sub-Saharan Africa, South Asia, and elsewhere, which just mirrors what we have seen in the past in other countries. In the United States, uh, companies like General Motors grew rapidly by creating a captive finance company, the General Motors Acceptance Corporation, which allowed them to sell their cars on credit. And suddenly it was a mass market product that everyone could afford. But that asset finance is not just or even primarily coming from banks or from MFIs in, in Africa and in Asia. It is increasingly generated by companies that make or sell the assets themselves, that know how to service them, that know how to replace them. These are the asset finance companies at the heart of our guide and they're who the guide is for. Look at this graphic, right? Um, this is the simplest possible demonstration of asset finance. A farmer on the right has acquired a solar water pump from a company that distributes them, represented by the smiling, happy son on the left. That company allows the farmer to pay for the pump over time as long as he signs a contract promising to make those payments in full and to you know, obey the consequences if he does not. The Sun Company, the, the water pump company, offers that pump on credit because they know that if they do, they can sell 10 times as many more. And that is not an exaggeration. That is simply what we've been told is the shift from offering products on cash to offering them on credit. If and when that farmer has made all of his payments and clear that obligation, the ownership of that asset becomes his. And that can lead to long-term use, increased income, and critically, additional collateral that he can use to secure more inputs for his farm. In this transaction, the, the farmer usually doesn't have to pledge additional collateral. The asset itself is repossessed in the event of default. And this is important because poor households do not have an excess of pledgeable assets. So our guide covers both loans and leases that look like this arrangement. And I should note that those are not the same thing. Loans and leases are obviously different, but for our purposes, they're similar enough in their relationship to credit risk. So what I just described, somebody gets an asset, they pay it back over time, they eventually own it and use it and then replace it or use it as collateral to acquire new assets, is how asset finance works optimally. But we are here today because asset finance for poor households comes with serious risks. It is a business of managing risks. Um, assets can break, currencies become devalued, rains fail, locusts arrive, regulations change. Some of these risks can be anticipated and mitigated, Others, such as the current pandemic, obviously cannot. And this guide focuses on one type of risk in asset finance, credit risk. Whenever a customer is given an asset now and promises to pay for it later, it is possible that they will not fulfill that promise. That possibility is credit risk. The potential losses that may occur if one or more borrowers fail to make agreed upon payments to their lender. And note that credit risk is the potential risk of this farmer failing to make payments, multiplied thousands or millions of times across the portfolio. Once that failure actually happens, as it now has here, uh, it is no longer risk, but an event. It is a default. Different companies define defaults differently, which we will get into later. And not all asset finance companies consider themselves creditors. Many of them are not regulated financial institutions, and they operate more like retail companies that allow customers to just pay over time. However, the basic principle of credit risk, an expected payment that may or may not be received, is at the core of any company that gives people assets now and expects them to pay later. And as I said before, there are many other risks to these businesses, and some of them are inextricably linked to credit risk and asset finance. But that key risk, that credit risk, that repayment risk is at the heart of our guide. And that's right. I've mentioned a guide several times now. We are proud to say that in the next two weeks, CGAP will be publishing a quite comprehensive and thorough technical guide to credit risk management. This is a user's manual at the core. It is meant for credit risk managers and senior executives at asset finance companies, as well as their investors, some of whom are on the line. It principally covers the four areas you see here, governance, product design, transaction risk, and portfolio risk. And my colleagues are going to get into that briefly. 
This guide was developed through quite a lot of work with an incredible array of partners. And I can't actually read off their names here. This would go even longer than it's going to. Um, but CGAP has worked directly with Frankfurt School and IPC to assess the credit risk management of over a dozen different asset finance companies, financing assets ranging all the way from smartphones to tractors. This guide is a summary of what we have learned throughout all of these engagements and would not have been possible without you know, the tireless work of people at each and every one of these companies you see here, as well as our just incredible partners at the you know, at Gogla and the Global Distributors Collective, who are industry bodies representing many of these companies and who were thought partners and resource partners and, and worked uh, with us throughout this entire process. Just a huge thanks to both of them. So what have we learned? Um, this guide, I cannot stress enough, is not really about our opinions or our assessment of the asset finance sector. You can get those, you can call us, we're happy to share. It's a bunch of tools at its core. Like I said, it's a user's manual. It has case studies, examples, and tools that show how credit risk management can be practiced in asset finance companies. But because the guide is 85 pages long, and some of you may be interested in, in knowing a little bit about what we found working with these companies, we will talk a little bit about our findings in that way. To begin with, I will just say I have always been consistently impressed by the dedication and creativity that asset finance companies have shown in reaching poor households. The companies we've worked with unanimously started with a social mission, a vision of what the world should be and who should have access to assets, and a deep sense of wanting to address the inequities that were there that prevented that access. Um, and then it worked off of that, right? Pay as you go financing, digital payments, innovative distribution, customer service. These are all innovations that allowed those companies to provide assets to customers who, let us be honest, are often among the highest risk customers in the world who they wanted to, ser to serve. And therein lies the tension, and it's an understandable one, because at its core, asset finance is a lending business, and that means managing risk. And we've seen firsthand that financial success in this sector, like in all lending sectors, is hugely determined by a company's ability to manage risk. The companies who are good at it grow sustainably and reach more customers over time. The companies who do not invest in it may reach a lot of companies rapid, customers rapidly, rather, but have struggled to sustain their scale and therefore their impact and become sustainable financially. And often, let us be honest, that push for scale comes from all of us, from the patient optimists, from the development professionals who want to see energy access addressed or want to see productive use go up or incomes rise or water sanitation addressed. We want to see inequities reduced, but a push for scale, whether for development goals or for just traditional financial gain, still can have the same negative effect on credit risk management, which is by nature a break on runaway growth. And we have a very strong historical precedent for this, right? In 2008, we look back at microfinance, which is not the same as asset finance, but there are areas we can learn from each other here. In 2008, microfinance was a rocket ship. It was the end to poverty and money was being shoveled at MFIs to grow and to grow quickly. Some MFIs were tripling their staff in a period of one to two years. Regional managers were being asked to cover up to 70 branches in places like Pakistan. And everyone was under a pressure to grow loan books because growing loan books had been shown at that point to, to link to a decrease in poverty. That research was later challenged and complicated. But this rapid growth had exactly the effect you think it would. In 2008, nobody was worried about credit risk in microfinance, as you can see from the, the sort of survey of, of stakeholders on the left. But we know what happened that year. And as the funding decreased and the borrowers felt the strain of a global recession, the tide began to go out. By 2009, credit risk was the number one concern among microfinance institutions and their investors. Institutions had been overextended, their customers were over indebted, and that effect was felt. MFIs had grown from small lending organizations to large institutions that had not put in the institutional frameworks to manage lending at scale. I should say the ones who did generally fared through the crisis much better. And you can read wonderful CGAP reports on, on the sort of growth and risk at that time but these institutions were not generally ready for rapid growth and it created severe actual repercussions for their customers. This was not just an academic issue. So the last words I will say before turning this presentation over to the real experts is that credit risk management matters. It matters for three big reasons. The first is that if an organization is unable to manage its risk, then it is unable to turn receivables into cash 
at an expected rate. And this leads to underperformance and at worst levels, it can lead to illiquidity or insolvency. If this happens to, across enough companies, then the sector's risk profile rises, making capital more expensive and making assets more expensive. Next one is affordability. And I love the James Grant quote here on the bottom right, because every debt gets paid. It is either paid by the debtor or the creditor, by the borrower or by the lender. If a company does not price in its losses, then investors pay for them. If it does price in its losses, which it should, then the customers pay for its credit risk management or don't pay if the credit risk management is good. To make assets affordable, companies need to minimize defaults through better assessment, monitoring, or collections. And this can mean investing a bit more in risk management upfront, paying a little more now to pay less for risk later. See the chart to the right where we see a sort of suboptimal allocation of, of management versus mitigation. And lastly, this is about building markets. Low-income households need more access to assets. They need lots of asset finance companies who can serve them. But CGAP's experience working with these companies showed that a failure to manage credit risk could push companies to shift more of their lending to higher income, less risky customer segments. And so every time a lender tries and fails to serve low-income clients, they make it harder for the next company to come in and make it harder for those clients to access the things they need. So it may, not, it may be that some customers are not financially viable at this time for some assets. But if the failures were addressable, if they could have been fixed, if, if they were pre the predictable result of poor risk management or governance, then this would represent a lost opportunity for companies and for households. And those households need literally every opportunity they can get. Sometimes the cost has to be covered by somebody else and subsidies may play a powerful role here. But the cost will always be there and it's our job to make sure it is low as possible and that it is allocated correctly and mitigated wherever we can. So with that, I will transfer things over to Walter Chukahirwa, who will go through a little bit more of the technical information in the guide. Thanks, Daniel. And I'll just commence by saying that, you know, a lot of what we saw uh, in the work that we did uh, with CGAP out there in the field with the various companies, which uh, Daniel showed earlier, was that, yes, indeed, within the industry, there was, um, an initial social push, rapid growth uh, that led to very, very quick achievement of scale. I think there was talk of, you know, the magic number being getting to 100,000 customers. However, along the way, companies began to realize that um, even as you make credit, you still need to get paid and therefore began introducing tools. And so one of the things that we bring out in the guide is that while there are quite a number of tools, and if you could just uh, move ahead, uh, Daniel, on the slide. So we have a variety of tools, you know, lockout technologies, uh, the use of call centers, uh, very good data analytics uh, in many of the companies, better than banks. Uh, you wouldn't even believe that, but uh, that's what we found. Um, some had even evolved to the stage of, you know, having the right approach to things such as reposition and so on and so forth. However, what was generally missing is um, having the toolbox and so having the right framework because the nature of risk and, and this it goes beyond credit risk, but the, the nature of, of um, <clears throat> the nature of credit risk or risk in general is that you have to have the right framework in place risks evolve over time. And because of that, you have to have a very robust process for identifying, measuring, monitoring, and then taking decisions on risks as they evolve. So you want to have the right governance arrangements in place, the right culture, oversight, determine the appetite for the organization. And some of these are issues that we're going to delve in a bit today, but uh, we'll go into a lot more depth uh, within the guide. You move the next slide, please. And so, um, the other thing also from a, from a risk management perspective is that asset finance companies, asset finance, especially for low income um, consumers in develop in the developing world, requires a unique set of skills. It's a unique blend of products and finance. I think SIGAP has done an excellent paper before. Uh, on the strange basis of what it was called. And what you realize is that managing risk requires a diverse set of skills. You will not find those skills easily. 
and certainly for maybe the smaller companies or those that have um, a smaller scale of operation, they might not even be able to afford those skills. So there's got to be a way in which we can, uh, as an industry and, and as stakeholders, transfer the required skill set that you know blends finance, that blends you know FMCG concepts, uh, to be able to pass these on, to be able to identify the real risks because. A lot of the risks come, say, through the manufacturing retail side and feed into the finance side of the companies. So um, we don't know all the answers, but one of the things we propose is that we could have, say, tailored and uh, targeted technical assistance to practitioners, uh, which could either come through uh, a tier fund, so where maybe you have a set of investees and um, employees, staff of the investees can then access the, and can be trained uh, either hands-on, classroom-based training and so on and so forth. Or again, as we go along the way, we can build a set of standardized training materials or training uh, areas. Um, for instance, the PAYGO Perform, uh, which is basically a set of tools for measuring credit risk. Uh, once that is finalized and rolled out, then you could have a training program on how to measure, how to track for the different companies. So that's one area where we could develop, say, standardized training so that subsequent to, you know, to developing the, the tools, this can be rolled out to different levels uh, within a given organization. We did find some organizations that had very good training programs, um, an induction program for, say, the agents, uh, for middle management, some other ways of, you know, continuous training, but it's one area where uh, overall uh, asset finance companies will have to continue investing. And unfortunately, many cannot afford to, to spend that kind of money while also growing rapidly and trying to manage the risk on their books. So <clears throat> it will be up to industry practitioners to uh, build this. And we hope that with the guide that becomes sort of a starting point for developing the right uh, TA arrangements. Certainly, there's a lot to learn, say, from microfinance. Uh, I think microfinance did, has done a lot of uh, uh, financing models to pass on skills. And that's why you can see that for many of those uh, institutions, um, over the years from, say, nine, the late 90s, by around 2010, 2015, microfinance professionals were highly skilled, or at least had uh, skilling opportunities especially in the areas of credit and operational risk. I think the same approach would do well in, um, in the asset finance uh, sphere. Could move on to the next slide, please. So uh, within the guide, I mean, the, as uh, Daniel and I have said, there's a lot more uh, detail within the guide, but there are certain key components of credit risk management that we thought would be important to discuss uh, during today's session. Uh, one of them, uh, should I say one of the more important ones is governance. You know, governance is such a key piece of, of this puzzle and not least because it also helps to address other risk categories that uh, an asset finance company will face. And uh, specifically with regards to credit risk, you know, you, you really want to have the right arrangements in place so that you can objectively and independently assess credit risk in an organization as it evolves. Um, the governance arrangements would basically uh, involve a variety of things, having the right leadership, uh, setting policies and procedures in place, holding people accountable, uh, ensuring the organization has the right ethics. Um, there are certain sensitive areas, and I think uh, the work that Google is doing around you know, consumer protection uh, is, is very useful, but an organization can only apply it if it has the right governance arrangements in place. Um, creating the right culture within the organization, it's really the tone at the top that will determine what culture you have. Um, many of us have seen what happened uh, during the 2008 financial crisis before and after, even to a long, for, for a large extent for the banking uh, industry, you know, they have all these fantastic tools, all these structures that are designed to make sure they're robust, but because there's a culture of excessive risk-taking, 
uh, taking advantage of customers and so on and so forth. Even the tools that they had were not sufficient to prevent many of them from doing um, unethical things. So it's the same thing with asset finance companies. If you don't have the right culture, then matter what kind of tools you have, you will still um, not manage risk effectively. Uh, communicating throughout the organization, both formal and informal is, is very, very key. And finally, having an arrangement where you have a variety of independent reviews. Uh, many asset finance companies are unregulated. Many operate in jurisdictions where even the, say, the energy regulator, regulators and so on and so forth are not sort of, um, do not have visibility. There's a credit book, uh, but which is not necessarily regulated. Um, if not, say, from practices, even in terms of pricing. So that leaves asset finance companies a bit open. And therefore, those that um, develop uh, the culture of conducting independent reviews, whether it's auditors, whether it's uh, rating agencies, and so on and so forth, uh, would improve, would find that their practices or their, uh, their operations improve as a result of that. The other bit is uh, in terms of the famous you know, three lines of defense, having the right structure. Uh, to, to ensure that there's a lot of independence and objectivity. Uh, this is a model that's been copied from uh, the banking world um, and it has proved to be very, very effective where it's used. It's a very, very good model for corporate governance. Uh, essentially, in summary, you have the three lines of defense. The first line is you know, business line operations where you have your senior management team, you know, C-suite, middle management and the operational staff. Um, these are responsible for implementation of business strategy, day-to-day -day operations and so on and so forth. Then we propose introduction of a second line uh, or the risk management unit, uh, which basically takes a proactive view to uh, overseeing risk, identifying risk areas, providing guidance on policy and procedures, supporting management basically to ensure that the organization manages risk, defines its risk appetite and uh, monitors risk on a periodic basis. And finally, to sort of cap it all up, you've got an internal audit unit, which would be, um, <clears throat> over, should I say, checking uh, compliance with internal policies and procedures, um, reports directly to the board, uh, to provide an objective and independent view of the operations of the institution uh, with regards to different, uh, different uh, areas of its operations. So they'll do periodic reviews, which are then discussed at board level and you know, action plans are tracked. All this again works well in the right uh, risk culture. You know, if the risk culture is not right, uh, then you, know, you have the, the frameworks, you have the tools, but they might not work as effectively. So the key question we always face or that we've, we've encountered uh, as we've done this work within the asset finance space is how do you, how do you roll this out for, um, for a small company, for instance, you know, uh, or an early stage company, so versus a larger stage mature company. And um, I think we try to summarize the number of things that the companies can do. So for instance, the smaller companies, um, certainly should have vision mission, should set the risk appetite. Uh, we'll talk more about risk appetite later, but it's a very, very key aspect. We find that it tends to be a copy and paste um, syndrome with regards to risk appetite, but each company should determine what their risk appetite is. At least you should have a board, um, some form of management information system, and some basic standard operating procedures for key operations such as credit, uh, operations, finance, uh, HR, um, consumer protection, and so on and so forth. As the organization grows and we think maybe around the size of $10 million to $25 million, then you want to see um, certain functions being introduced, say the risk officer, uh, you could have an audit function that is outsourced, uh, Certainly, if you can afford it, also uh, bring it, uh, have it internal, but basically have a framework for the three lines of defense that we described uh, earlier. And then, as the company now, you know, 
grows beyond 25 million, 20, 25 million dollars, uh, then you know the, the, it has sufficient capacity and resources to have a board complete with subcommittees, to have more sophisticated software, uh, to have an internal risk unit. The risk unit could even be subdivided into certain risk categories. Uh, because at a larger scale, many of these become even more specialized and more complicated to track. So uh, it will also certainly have an, its own internal audit uh, unit. Walter, this is brilliant. Um, we've just got one question from the chat and I think it's probably best to just ask it now while people's minds are fresh. I think you've answered the sort of questions about how feasible it is to implement in small institutions, but what about institutions that complain about the cost of compliance um, and maybe that keeps them from becoming you know, regulated financial institutions and they remain sort of in the, in the kind of gray area? Um, do you have any thoughts on sort of the costs of that or when the right time is to think about that decision? I'd ask you to maybe keep your answer to, to one minute. Yeah, I think certainly the, you have to weigh the trade-off. Uh, in some cases, the say, certainly say in microfinance, we've seen instances where the cost of compliance was very prohibitive. Let's say you are regulated and you need to have, you know, a very large, let's say you're an early stage, maybe a $10 million business, but with, you know, mature uh, institution balance sheet ETC. And the cost of compliance in that case could be a bit prohibitive. However, for say an asset finance company, unless you are being um, forced to have certain roles, to have certain uh, resources deployed, the cost of having uh, this kind of structure should not be very, very prohibitive. You can also outsource um, both risk and the internal audit function. And uh, think about it from the perspective of, you know, how much does it cost if you lose, let's say a series of loans, a bunch of loans, and then you try to look at the opportunity cost, then right. uh, it could actually make it a more uh, viable option to have the, to have these structures in place earlier. Thank you so much. Um, Isaac, I'll take it over to you. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, Walter. Um, I just wanted to spend a very few minutes talking a little bit more about risk appetite that Walter um, already introduced. Um, and it, it's really about taking a step back, I think, and, and mentioning that risk appetite is that element of a risk management framework that sets the tone for how your organization perceives risk. And in that sense, I know when we talk about risk management, it can be and it can seem rather abstract. It can seem rather theoretical, but really risk appetite is intimately tied to your business model, to your strategy about what it's gonna take for your organization to succeed and hit its objectives, both impact and financial objectives. And so it has to come from the very top. It has to come from the board, and from management um, at, the, at the CEO, at the executive level, as Walter said. And it, it contains ultimately both qualitative statements about how your organization perceives risk, what risks it wishes to manage, what's its strategy um, in the market, and also quantitative statements to regards to what is it targeting with relation to earnings, to liquidity, to capital adequacy, to portfolio at risk. And Clearly, in order to make this operational, though, we then need to take it down through the organization. And that, um, first of all, requires a certain set of risk metrics where we need to define what, do, what are acceptable risk levels um, for different types of risk. And here we're again, as Walter said, not only talking about credit risk, but this is incredibly relevant for credit risk, which we're speaking of today. So an example of a risk target, which is really about what we want to see in order to hit our objectives, what we think is needed, um, what we think is good, is, for example, targeting early defaults of 1% or targeting a portfolio at risk after 30 days of 5%, for example. Then we also want to define the next levels, the stretch and the red line, so to speak, the stretch being risk tolerance. What can we endure? So in our example, we're willing to tolerate 2% early defaults for each monthly cohort. Um, and then risk capacity is the awareness of if we operate at a, at a certain level of risk, this, this is gonna break the organization, so to speak, or we're not gonna hit our objectives or we're not gonna be able to be profitable. And 
defining those red lines can be also incredibly important. Once you have these things in place, you're then able to take a step to say, okay, so we need, if we're gonna set some triggers, some tipping points, what would those be? So for in this example, you might wanna set a risk limit at 1.2% early defaults to say that when that metric hits that number, we know that these and these actions are taken. And that's what I wanted to also highlight. You, none of this is effective unless you're able to have the data, to, which is the management information systems, um, the business intelligence that Walter mentioned to track the metrics and the outcomes. And if you're able to have the controls, which are the very practical measures to shape those outcomes. Um, I, in, in our findings, in our work with companies in the sector and, and both on this assignment and beyond, I think we found that a lot of companies in the sector have an idea about their losses, potentially, potentially on a quarterly or aggregate level. But in many ways, regarding portfolio quality and what's happening to their in, in their different client groups with regards to the performance of their pay plans or their um, loan contracts, they're really operating rather blind. Um, and so we can't overemphasize the importance of good data. Um, and the ability to know what is happening in portfolio, which allows you to be able to track performance against risk metrics, and then allows you to in turn, the third element of implement controls. And, and again, this is something, this is really not something that's tremendously complex. It can be something as simple as job descriptions, incentive structures for your staff, um, defining a review process for new contracts, defining how do we incentivize our sales agents? Um, are we, is, is collections or is following up with clients a part of the job? And so these are the things that really allow us to, the, the levers and the, and, the, and the information that allows us to manage to our risk appetite. And I think if we're honest though, a lot of us know that many companies in the sectors don't actually, in the sector don't actually have defined risk appetites. I think we have a lot of implicit risk appetites that are understood by our staff and our management because of how we operate. But um, the, there, there's not a lot of def definition around these risk appetites. And, and very quickly, I think there may be three reasons for this. We, have mm -hmm. a, we operate in an environment of, of limited regulation, as Dan said, and Walter mentioned, we also operate in an environment where investors have been incentivizing growth and sales. And then we have a belief that in order to hit our impact metrics, we need to take extra risks. And I think each of those things is worth um, thinking about, but ultimately remembering that if we're not managing these risks, as Dan said, we're not going to be able to be sustainable. We're not going to be able to hit our impact targets either. So. Isaac, one of the things we see a lot, um, and I think this, there's a range of, of quality of practice in this, but is, is mm. the attempt to address risk through pricing. Um, and I and there's a relationship, and obviously that needs to happen. And you can talk just a little bit about what provisioning is and, and how that fits in. But for companies that really look to address risk management solely through a pricing mechanism, what has been your experience with that? How, I mean, what is the complexity there that you would see in the relationship between pricing and credit risk management in general? And I guess I'll ask you if you can if you can sum all that up in about ninety seconds. I'd appreciate yeah, sure. Um, thanks, Dan. I think there are two very quickly. There are two two elements, right? I mean, as you said, there's there's a uh, an element of expected losses, which we want to try to model and include in our in our in our risk premium, which is a part of our pricing, and that's that's good practice. That's normal. That's how it should be. That requires though an ability to model expected losses. Um, that said, even there, there's a bit of a limit to what how much how much risk you can actually price in. If you're talking about expected losses of, of 30 to 40%, which we've seen in some cases, then that becomes difficult to price in and you get into questions of consumer protection, how high prices can go, who's bearing the cost of risk, to get back to your question. But I think where risk management really shows its value and where there's a real limit to the strategy is in the unexpected losses, right? In the, in the volatility, in the things that you can't model. And a risk management framework allows us to begin to control those limits and to set controls that allow us to mitigate that risk. And you can't price in some of these, some of these things. And so I think that's where you, you're gonna be faced in the business with frequently with unpredictability, with volatility that can easily sink an entire business. And um, that's, 
I, I we would argue just a, a risk that you don't want to take, so to speak, and, and something that you can't really price in and that you're much better served developing just even the basics of a risk management framework to help you manage those. That's really well said. Thank you so much, Isaac. Uh, Holger, over to you. Thanks, Dan. Um, yeah, we were just speaking a little bit more on the on the um, first on the governance and and on the portfolio risk side. And Isaac very rightly mentioned the importance of data, and I'm, I want to come back to that in a minute. In a minute, um, before a couple of words on what we have seen as Frankfurt School from our C gaps and, and other assignments in the industry with regards what we would call transaction risk management. Yeah. We, we are used to break credit risk management into transaction risk and portfolio risk management, whereas transaction means actually the assessment of the individual customer and his or her uh, payment ability. And what you see here on the slide is that ability is actually just one axis and willingness is the other one. And we are used, and I guess that's also borrowed from microfinance to classify uh, customers in this uh, two dimensional matrix uh, by their willingness to cooperate in a way to make uh, the payments when they are due and their ability. Um, both is not necessarily easy to assess. Um, one would probably say that ability is typically easier than willingness, um, but there are uh, quite some, some tools in the toolbox to, to achieve that goal. Before coming to that, however, um, the, the big question in the industry is still how we figure that out. And um, what we have seen is that there is a quite diverse range, I would call it, um, how companies address that. And without a particular um, valuation of those, um, we really see ranges where, where companies um, almost don't go beyond typical know your custom questions uh, to companies um, which do two on-site visits and additional call center interview of the customer, maybe one then a scorecard, a statistical or judgmental, judgmental scorecard, and based on that form the decision. Um, there is no universal approach on that. I, I'll be sharing my, my personal view uh, on that in a minute. Um, but what we see in the industry, and I guess that's, that's naturally clear, is that the, the higher the value of the asset is, the higher the margin of the asset is, typically the more uh, somebody would and should invest into that exercise. Um, we see companies, for example, which um, sell relatively low value assets uh, without big analysis to a customer. And if that customer is paying well on those, maybe a, a simple solar system, which just enables you to light one room, so to say. Um, if the customer is able and, and, and showing uh, a good repayment, then he would qualify him or herself to get a higher um, a, a higher value asset, maybe with which you can also run a TV or, or a radio. Or so. so that's kind of an internal uh, verification um, and idea to, to find out about a customer's ability and willingness. And others go another way via interviews, uh, on-site visits, um, take some tools um, to verify incomes and expenses, uh, for example. And um, yeah, that's, that's a really a, a wide range we see here. From my personal experience and recommendation, um, and I, and I am a, a data-driven kind of risk management guy. Uh, I wanna, wanna just come back to that data component. In the 21st century, and with the um, technical background many of these companies have, uh, Walter was mentioning that we, we, many of those have a better IT system 
a better technical understanding and, and technology in place than many MFIs and banks. Um, what we see often a bit missing is the, the risk management understanding how to make use of that data. So we do encourage every company to collect, to capture data, um, to save that data, to store that data in a, in a system which allows you to assess that data afterwards in a structured way. And when you think that further, um, the step to a machine learning based credit scoring approach isn't actually so far. Um, the importance is always that you get the data first. And from experience, what we realized is that there are often, I would call them two, um, let's say things which many companies are worrying about when it comes to all this data uh, capturing process and the, the individual uh, customer analysis process. First, they do not trust the data. It's necessarily naturally hard to verify data. Um, it's hard to get a solid estimate on income, for example. Uh, many of you know that. Go to a customer in a rural uh, neighborhood and ask for his or her steady income. And um, people struggle to report that figure simply because they, they, they lack the, maybe the financial understanding or, or simply uh, steady income streams. Um, that is true, but I still encourage you very, very much to ask these questions and to record the data. It's not necessarily necessary to, to invest too much time into data, data verification, um, but when you are able to collect data of 1,000, 10,000, 50,000 customers, a simple machine learning algorithm, and that sounds fancy and is still no rocket science. Uh, we have internalized that in many, many companies of, of the sizes uh, you, you are from. Um, then the algorithm will detect outliers, unusual patterns, more or less automatically. Um, so don't worry too much about that. And the, th the second um, thing many, many companies are worrying about is that they bother the customer too much when they, um, when they interview them for, for 30 minutes or even longer. Um, that this annoys the customer, makes them upset, and um, maybe uh, makes them move to another company. <laughs> that is... From my experience, and uh, Walter Isaac participants, uh, free to feel free to, to agree or disagree on that. But from, from my experience, that's more a thesis than evidence. Um, I've hardly seen any customer who really felt upset by having been interviewed for 30 minutes. And imagine how much data you can get in 30 minutes. And by data, I really mean I just mean asking questions about living conditions, household yeah. income, and so on and so forth. Sorry, uh, usually longer than, than I was supposed to speak, <laughs> but it's, it's a strong appeal for collecting data in a, what I would call machine readable format and, and use that data uh, for structured analytics. Yeah, and I, I can't echo that point enough, just the impact we've seen from having a clear, well-structured database that just limits data to what you can actually analyze. Um, the, the work Holger and others have done with the companies we worked with on that was, was really impressive. We've got time for, I think, just one question before we move on to the, the conversations with people. And I think I'd like to highlight the one um, that's been asked to us by Jose Echegoyen which is around risk appetite framework is a must, but if you do not have mechanisms to enforce the limits, it is just a tick the box exercise. And so um, I guess, uh, I think Isaac, that probably falls closest to what you were talking about. So I'll let you have a, a quick crack at that. What are, those, what are those mechanisms? I think you started to talk about them a little bit, but if you could just elaborate a little bit more on how you get from setting limits to actually hitting them. 
Yeah, thanks, Dan. I think that gets to the to some of what Walter was talking earlier about some of the tools in the toolbox, right? And and uh, and some of those things. And, and the guide has a lot more information on this. Um, this is a very good question. It gets it relate to to things like to to of course setting setting the tone in in the organization. I think, and I can't emphasize that enough regarding what. Um, what's important, but as far as the actual controls, which is I think what you're getting at here, how do you, how do you shape behavior? Um, what we've seen to be very important in, in many of these asset financing companies is really incentive structures. How are your sales officers incentivized? What at the end of the day are the metrics and the KPIs they're expected to hit? Usually right. they're revenue based. Um, that's an important one. You have, you have things like um, internal audit functions, which provides a third view um, to check whether policies and procedures, which is another element, are being are being implemented and followed, um, and so and and I, Dan, I'll, I'll keep it short. But I mean, you have a variety yeah. of things, and the guide goes goes into great depth on this, um, related to ensuring that you have the ability to to change some things. Um, you know, if if. If, uh, if, for example, you see a metric getting out of hand that you have the ability to shift staff time rather from um, going out and generating new sales to moving it to collections, for example, okay. or that you're, you're making your credit assessment approach a little bit more stringent um, so that you can course correct and, and, and do that before you get your indicators hit your red line. Thank you so much. I think we're going to have to pause the question and answer there, but uh, perhaps we'll have a little bit more time at the end. Uh, perhaps we won't. We'll certainly be a chance to reach out to me and other experts, sorry, and the actual experts on the call following the, the webinar. I'd like to move on to our credit risk managers. Um, so we have two wonderful individuals here. I'll ask them to say hello in a second. Uh, Allison Bass is the head of credit op operations at Angie Energy Access, where she works across nine markets to provide responsible clean energy financing. Angie Energy Access is a, a new company that is resulted from the merger of several uh, off-grid energy access companies, including Phoenix International, uh, Mobisol, and, and Power Corner. Allison can say more about that in a second. Allison has over a decade of experience in providing inclusive financial services across Africa, working for Phoenix at their clean energy company, Bright Life. I'm sorry, at Finca rather, with their clean energy company, Bright Life. She's led strategy and management at Finca's microfinance bank, Sharp in Nigeria. She supported the launch of new financial products, digital channels, and improved standards all across Africa. How are you, Allison? Thank you. Hi, Dan. Good. And we also have Rodney Schuster, who is the Senior Risk Consultant and Head of Special Projects at Tugende, which is a for-profit social enterprises social enterprise that uses asset finance to help entrepreneurs increase productivity. And on, uh, Rodney has held high-level positions at a host of large MFIs and banks, Uganda Microfinance Limited, Equity Bank. He joined Tugende in 2017 as the Head of Risk and Corporate Affairs and has been a key member of their senior management team as they try to achieve this exponential growth and rollout of the regional expansion plan while still managing the risks. Hi, Rodney, how are you? Hi, Dan, great to be here, thanks. Thank you. Um, I'd like to ask you both, uh, if I could, to, to just give us a brief introduction to your business, what it does, particularly around asset finance, and what the core strategy is around risk management. And if you want, I can only imagine sitting here listening for the last 45 minutes. Um, you may have had reactions to some of what's been said. You may have had strong reactions even. So if there's anything you'd like to just quickly respond to from the, the sort of introductory part of this session, feel free to go ahead and, and take a whack at one piece of that. Uh, Allison, why don't we start with you? Okay, great. Um, as Dan mentioned, I'm head of credit operations for NG Energy Access and our two main business lines are microgrids and uh, solar home systems. Uh, so we sell uh, solar home systems in nine markets across Africa on a pay-as-you-go finan financing model that's a bit of a hybrid of a, of a loan and pay go um, approach. Um, it's a vertically integrated business. So we design the products, handle all the sales and distribution, all the financing after sales service and support. Um, and currently have around 700,000, just shy of 700,000 customers who are paying for their mm -hmm. solar home systems um, across our network of um, um how do you manage risk? Um, how do we manage risk? We uh, have, I guess there's actually a lot to say about the approach that we use, but I think maybe we'll talk more about the toolbox mm. and less tools, as you were saying earlier. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. For uh, 
just general background, I think overall we use, we have a heavy emphasis on the data that we have to use it well, to use it to understand our performance, to use it to forecast um, where, where we believe our performance is going in the future. And we have a lot of data given the, the fact that we operate in so many markets and have had um, quite a large customer base across um, the years from both Mobisol and Phoenix. So we have the um, fortune of a lot of historical data to use and quite a good infrastructure. Um, and that's been extremely helpful for us to really understand what's happening in the underlying portfolio, what changes are happening in the new portfolio that we may be bringing on as we grow. Um, and it's opened up conversations on risk appetite and governance and what is and isn't acceptable for us in terms of business performance related to the credit portfolio overall. Um, yeah. So a key element that we, we do feature within our credit risk management is to define our risk appetite within our pricing. Um, our, our pricing plans are at the product level and the payment plan level. And it's basically an expression of what we are comfortable to absorb as a company in terms of credit risk and the cost of risk um, within a specific product in a given market. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and then I guess another key aspect of our approach that is um, uh, interesting now that we've integrated these two companies is to use a, a segmented approach to look at the, the product segments that we have and the underlying customer base um, that uh, each of those products target. We have a range of products from around $120, which would be more like a two light system um, to, mm -hmm. to maybe $1,500 and $1,800 solving different challenges in energy and having um, appliances and more um, accessories and lighting attached to it. So, they're fundamentally different levels of exposure. They're different products for different use cases and they're different customer segments that it's addressing. So our model is not one size fits all, which adds some complexity, but rather um, segmenting our approaches um, in pricing as well as in things like assessment and credit origination based on the product that we're providing and the customer segment that it's serving. Um, and then I think we have a, probably a lot to say about how we manage the credit cycle more specifically in the impl implementation aspects as well, but we can leave. Yeah, hopefully we can get into that. Um, but let me, let me sw swing it over to, to Rodney and see. Rodney, could you just give us a, a brief introduction to the assets you finance and, and kind of, again, as, as much as you can within the compressed time frame, uh, just a general sense of what sure. your approach to risk management is at Tugenda. Sure. Um, thanks. Um, so Tukende, just a bit of background, is a for-profit uh, micro-leasing higher purchase company um, with our core product being the Boda Boda or motorcycle taxi. And we've recently ventured into other income generating assets such as carpentry machinery, boat engines, car taxis, etc. cetera. Uh, we have served about 50,000 clients and about we have about 30, 35,000 active clients. Um, so when I joined our, uh, in 2017, about four years ago, our, our main uh, Chris credit risk management um, sort of uh, tool was a really hands-on, high-touch approach. Um, like many startups, um, the CEO to the cleaner were all involved in, in credit risk management. Um, I think everyone knew if a client didn't pay or who was late or those kinds of things. Um, I think it was very reactive and, you know, if, if, if people didn't pay uh, because of the um, uh, regulatory structure, we were able to uh, use the threat or actually um, repossess the asset pretty quickly without sort of going to court or things like that. So that was really our, the most basic and quite effective, I may add, uh, credit risk management uh, process. Of course, that can only work for so long as we began to scale and grow um, and open more branches and hire more staff. Um, I think I've helped lead the transition uh, to some of this data-based um, credit risk management strategy, looking at you know, uh, PAR 1, PAR 30, some of these key metrics um, uh, that sort of is in the toolbox, um, and trying to... Uh, be less reactive and more predictive about you know which branches might have problems, 
um, you know, some of these uh, uh, marks that you mentioned earlier about the one, two percent uh, par 30 and what do we do when that happens and um, who is available to support the branches if, if uh, uh, people have hit certain thresholds. Um, what's interesting, I would say, is that from, from my side is trying to push credit risk management into a company, a very high growth company. Um, has been a bit of a challenge in the sense that everyone agrees that it's very important, but historically our par and our performance has been quite good. Uh, we're talking about a par 30 percentage of, of historically one, 2%. And so, you know, everyone's like, well, that's great, Rodney, but, um, you know, talk to us when we have issues, right? And I'm like, well, we need to put this in place and before we have issues, right? Yeah. And, um, you know, of course, the pandemic didn't help anything. Um, but um, so I think it's been a slow process for us trying to move away from sort of the high touch, um, you know, every, from the CEO, everyone involved in credit risk management to a more um, systematic, um, institutionalized, data driven um, credit risk management. And we've we've made some progress. Um, and I think we continue to, to work on on sort of things that you've mentioned and that's in the toolbox uh, from risk appetite to um, you know, metrics uh, to a, a monthly and quarterly risk meeting and things like that. So I hope that was brief enough. <laughs> it, was, it was, it was, it was Thanks. concise. Yeah. And, and, and okay. it leads me directly to a question to Allison then, which is, I think, I think Rodney's really talked yeah. nicely about the kind of evolution of the organization as you grow. Um, Phoenix has expanded into quite a few company countries rather in the last few years. And you've been a, a, a big part of that. And I've just had the opportunity to sit at least with different risk measures you have in different countries. And, and I know the work that's gone into kind of maintaining those standards and building it while I think allowing for some locally specific context to sort of you know, creep into the structure and how that's managed, not creep in, but, but is actually baked into it. If you just talk, I guess, about that regional expansion and how you maintain and manage credit risk across such a diverse group of countries and, or, and sort of country level organizations. Um, great, yes. Uh, first I'll say it's a work in progress and yeah, sure. um, the work never ends for sure. Um, yeah, when I first joined Phoenix in 2018, we just expanded from one market to three and built a global team and now under NG Energy Access um, with combining with Mobisol, it's now nine markets. So it's very fast expansion of the markets, the team or like organizational size, the customer base, et cetera. Um, and I think that we're still, um, and, and the most important thing was really getting folks to fundamentally understand the importance of credit and credit performance within the organization and to have buy-in and attention paid to it because there were so much else going on with an organization growing that quickly um, to have it be at the forefront of the minds of our leadership and understand how that um, performance affects our cash flow, P&L, our balance sheet, um, and ultimately uh, and importantly, our mission and our business objectives was um, really important, um, especially in the early High, very high growth stages. Um, and then I think overall, the approach that has been working well for us that we're continuing to work on is to define um, general frameworks, general ways of thinking, ways of working that apply um, across risk management in each of our markets, um, basically defining the KPIs that we want to track and against which we want to set thresholds or express what our appetite is or how much exposure or concentration we want, want to have yeah. in any um, given risk portfolio, um, as well as general standards on how we manage our credit operations and translate the uh, principles of risk management and the, the limits that we want to adhere to into yeah. the mm -hmm. ways that we routinely manage the organization. Um, so it, it is a challenge to work it into existing business models that are merging together and a challenge to keep up with the pace of growth. Um, but I guess one of the things you asked what a reaction might be to something earlier that was shared. Yeah. Uh, to slide on where you should be if you have $10 million in your portfolio <laughs> or $25 million in your portfolio. Um, and we're not quite there yet. And we have $100 million in our portfolio, but I right. think the right place to start is now and keep working on it and chipping away at it and 
um, putting especially those more, more broad governance structures and visibility and your performance in place um, and then drilling down to how you can practically help individual countries manage that day to day and supporting the building of the systems and um, the tools that help them in their day to day routines. I like it. Credit risk management is like a tree. The, the best time to build it was five years ago. The second best time is, is now. Um, that's right. <laughs> I think that's right. Yeah, fantastic. Um, this is such an unfairly short time to chat with both of you, uh, but I wanted to make sure I asked each of you a question about this. You both finance different types of assets, uh, your different companies. Those are physical things. They break, they come in boxes, they have to be shipped and carried gently, they have to be installed, wires get loose, all sorts of things. You're gonna talk about them. Could you just talk about how the, the physical asset either you know, creates risk or mitigates it, how, how you sort of think about the asset as you're triangulating the customer and you and this asset they're using to manage credit risk collectively? Um, and also, why don't you start, and then Rodney, if you could come in. Okay, great. Um, yeah, it's a super interesting question, because at the end of the day, we're counting on that product to solve problems for the customer, um, and they're only going to pay for it over time if that is the case and continues to be the case for the one, two, or three years over which they're, they're paying for this energy asset. Um, so the product is fundamental to the entire business model, obviously. Um, and part of the features that we have in um, our product lineup, as is common within the energy sector, is um, lockout technology. Um, so the product is not accessible if the customer is not paying as per their loan agreement and becomes unlocked and usable if they're on track with their payment plan. Um, that's a feature that has been demonstrated to be pretty successful in uh, that first level of um, uh, kind of behavioral nudges to get the customers to repay. We also have uh, interfaces on the devices themselves that help the customer to be able to know where they are in their payment plan. Uh, but it's a very complex piece of technology relative to anything else yeah. that customers have owned. And um, the fact of having quite a lot to manage in terms of, of the interface and of the cabling, et cetera, a lot of things can go wrong from the installation to just basically wires and cables chew through, et cetera. Um, even if they're outside of a GSM network, you might have problems getting data to understand what's happening for their product. So we, we do have the challenge of understanding what's happening at any given time when a customer is not paying us to identify if it's um, an actual capacity or willingness issue, or if they just need help and support to figure right. out something that's gone wrong with their product or potentially its installation. Um, so that's definitely a, a frequent um, challenge that we tackle. Um, and I suppose another feature of our products is that lockout technology um, is pretty successful in, um, in terms of being able to promote customers to repay. It also can translate into customers wanting to figure out how they might tamper the system to be able to have free solar right. power as long as they want. So being able to track and um, uh, identify when a tamper might have taken place and be able yeah. to follow whether it was accidental or otherwise um, is important for us as well. And I suppose the last one around the physical asset is that it's movable. Um, so we may have sold product in one location uh, for a customer who had been there quite a long time, but for any number of reasons, they may shift and so being able to contact our customers in the future and be able to uh, find them physically if we need to, to be able to provide them service or support does become difficult uh, when uh, the product can be installed, but then it could potentially be installed and, and move along with them in the future as well. Rodney, movable assets, that's what Tugende does. Your stuff is literally on wheels. Um, how do you manage mm -hmm. the risk of that? Um, yeah, I mean, I think just um, sort of um, complementing what Allison said, it's it's a bit of a challenge, right? Because this asset is we're lending to our clients to help our clients. Yet this is also our security um, to protect the or the institution. Yeah. Um, so for us, we have uh, GPS units in in the motorcycles and in our other assets. So uh, it's relatively easy to monitor. Um, surprisingly, um, motorcycle taxis, particularly in Uganda and Kenya, are not ones to just, you know, uh, 
move to a, another city or move, um, you know, to another what we call stage where they're um, their uh, meeting point for the motorcycles. So for for that standpoint, it's fairly easy to monitor. I think what what I found um, in my position is that some of my operational colleagues always tend to fall back on, well, we've got the motorcycles collateral. And, you know, not looking at the full cost of, um, of repossession or the impact on the client per se, or um, trying to improve credit risk management techniques because they keep saying, well, we've got the bike as, a, as collateral. So, so it's, it, it adds to the complexity of my work to try and convince uh, my operational colleagues that, hey, we need to improve our credit risk management uh, techniques, our tools, um, and not just say, well, we have this, um, this um, uh, asset that we can, that would protect our, our financing. So it's a bit of a challenge. Um, and of course, we don't ever want to take the asset because of course that's, that defeats some of our social mission. So, so it's a bit of a challenge, um, I think, as opposed to microfinance where it's just uh, mainly um, lending cash um, and you're not really have a, a, a good, um, an avenue to uh, repossess, we do. And I think um, it, it prevents a sort of a different um, uh, array of challenges. But I mean, overall, it does, uh, the threat of taking the asset really helps our credit risk management. So uh, more than the repossession. That's really powerful. Um, and, and the social mission, I think, is just always worth coming back to. So I appreciate you bringing us there. Yeah, we are unfortunately out of time. There's been some really interesting questions in the chat around alternative data analysis, um, as well as you know insurance on assets. Uh, if, if either of you would care to hop in the chat and sort of participate or answer on any of those, that'd be great. Um, obviously, we'll, we'll try and get to as many as we can, but I'd like to make sure we bring on the investors. So, thank you, Allison. Thank you, Rodney. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, and bringing us home. The gentleman. Um, I'd like to introduce two experienced and, and really deeply insightful investors that, that I know. I'm proud to first introduce my colleague at Acumen, uh, Andrew Tarazi Tarawali, who is a portfolio manager at Acumen West Africa, where he is responsible for sourcing and end to end deal management for investments. Before Acumen, Andrew served as a senior investment professional for Anjaro Investments, which is an impact investor focused on agriculture in West Africa. Um, yeah, Andrew is a member of the Institute of Directors in Ghana, has been a fellow with Impact Business Leaders and the Foundation for African Leadership in Business. Andrew, how are you? I'm doing well, Damian. Thanks for the introduction. I don't think there's much I can add. I would hope not. <laughs> yeah. One list of compliments. Awesome. Um, also with us is Avi Jacobson, who is the Investment Director for SunFunder. Um, he's going to tell us a little bit more about what SunFunder does. He oversees and leads their transactions, debt transactions primarily in the solar home system sector for products ranging from basic inventory loans to arranging syndicated structured receivables facilities. And prior to joining SunFunder, Avi was the director of market analysis at Lumos Global, which is a solar home system provider that launched initially in Nigeria. And he previously has worked at the United States Air Force and elsewhere. Avi, how are you? Doing well. Thank you very much for having me. Oh, thanks for joining this conversation. Yeah, I'll, I'll stay on you for a second. Um, can you talk a little bit about what kind of investor you are and what, what SunFunder is really at its core? And, uh, you know, we, we did all this work uh, for research. We were interested in learning about it. You look at credit risk management, uh, to, to, you know, you put dollars on the line. So it'd be great if you could talk a little bit about your exposure to credit risk management in the companies that you invest in. And then, Andrew, I'm going to ask the same to you in a second. Sure, definitely. So as you mentioned, SunFunder, like you mentioned, we are a debt investor and we lend to companies that are providing solar energy services uh, across emerging markets. The vast majority of our focus has been in sub-Saharan African countries. Our largest office and most of our investment team is actually based in Nairobi. And we've been doing this now for about eight years. We've really grown up with the pay-as-you-go solar sector. Uh, now we have exposure across pay you go also working with mini grids, uh, CNI developers, and I've had the chance to work with companies that are solarizing uh, telco towers uh, across the region as well. So really looking at, you know, the fun with solar is it's incredibly scalable from giant utility scale projects, really down to tiny micro lanterns or, you know, the solar in my watch that keeps the battery charged. 
yeah. you know, it's everywhere, um, which gives a lot of opportunity to assess. But as you mentioned, particularly with my focus, um, having been in a lot in our pay-as-you-go portfolio, I'm very careful to talk about pay-as-you-go and not just solar home systems. Because as you mentioned with asset finance here, we've talked about all the wide range of products that uh, NG Energy Access is providing. Um, yeah. You know, from $120 sort of cost of unit with you know, two lights up to, you know, almost $2,000. Essentially, it's a micro, you know, SME power package right there. Um, and then similarly, you could look at productive use applications or solar power you know, irrigation pumps. You know, often those are being sold now on more of a pay-as-you-go type uh, right. structure, which, but it's, you know, same idea, same fundamentals, but it's sort of a very different application that requires some specialized uh, underwriting on the behalf of the operator. You know, our role is, you know, a company that's grown up with the sector is really trying to be, like I said, specializing in how do we analyze, assess, and get comfortable with investing against their credit management process. I like the comment that came up at one point where some companies tend to think of themselves as retail operators yep. when they're really asset finance companies. Um, so we can, you know, maybe they don't have a lot of time, but talk about, you know, how a company's accounting policies might say, you know, have a philosophical implication for how they think of themselves versus what the business is actually doing, uh, which I think is a, a really important thing to, to track. But in general, our investors invest in our funds based on our ability to underwrite against a company's credit processes, essentially. And then our ability to operate is based on our understanding of that credit. It's, you know, kind of, like I said, turtles all the way down, right? It's all <laughs> credit policy assessment. You know, hopefully our investors get it right because we're getting it right because our clients are getting it right. That's right. Um, that's really well said, and, and we'll definitely come back into that. But uh, Andrew, uh, love for you to tell us a little bit about what Acumen does in West Africa and, and your role there, and um, how an equity investor looks at the same question, right? Uh, it's obvious job, I think, in many ways to see the, the risks and the downside, but you, you're looking for the upside. You're looking at what this you know, small company could one day become. How do you balance that, that, that desire for upside with the risks that you have to consider and how they manage them? Sure, like you mentioned it just now, we're an equity investor, so I guess we are looking at the long-term upside, and we typically try to understand um, where the company is today and whether the team they have, especially with the promoters or the senior management team, are they flexible enough to be able to evolve over time? Because we know, especially with the investments we make and the stage they are, they're very early stage, and typically when we do invest, a lot of them have assets less than a million dollars. So they're really, really small, but we, we expect them to obviously go over time. So we're not expecting them to have all the tools in place or apply the toolbox, as you guys just outlined. We don't expect, but we expect that the senior management team or the promoters are open to be able to learn, open to be able to adapt, open to be able to evolve over time. And we do de definitely get um, into the nitty gritty of things doing due diligence. We typically have like two types of due diligence. We have the first one when it's like getting to know them, get to be comfortable with the entrepreneur and his team. And when we do these exercises, we typically want to make sure that not only do they have policies that are on paper, but the company lives according to what they've stated. Because I think somebody mentioned earlier that sometimes just like a right. checkbox us is more than a checkbox. So for example, if you say you have a credit policy, when we meet with the team, we like to interact with even the most junior level staff to see if they really do understand the credit policy. So we'll ask questions like, um, if a, how many weeks does a customer sort of have missed payments for how many weeks do they do you possess? That way we know not only do frontline workers understand the policy, but also back office people understand the policy. We also obviously want to understand how they monitor their customers, not only in terms of usage, but how they're making payments, whether they're being late, they're being on time. We also obviously want to understand how currently they are doing collections and what is the policy on write-offs, what is the policy on repossession, things like that. And we then see, most times we see gaps there, obviously the, the areas of improvement, but right. that doesn't um, make us run away. The other says, okay, let's see if we can work with the team to be able to close those gaps. And teams that are, I guess, open 
to ideas and we feel approachable at those ones that we typically would make a, take a bet on. Don't get me wrong, it's still, uh, the investments we make, we know they're still high risk investment because these companies are relatively early stage. But obviously in terms of our mission, if we're gonna change the way the world tackles poverty, we yeah. believe we have to take bet on companies that, that appear to be innovative and aligned with our values. Yeah, I love what you said about you know, taking away from that, that that tick box to really, okay, these are the policies, how are they being implemented? What does it look like at the medium and, and the junior levels of the, the organization? Um, Avi, just as we're staying on due diligence, I mean, what can you take us somewhat into the nitty gritty in the time we have about uh, what you look for and, and what you find the most helpful questions and, and sort of analytics to run? Sure, I think ultimately as it's come up a couple of times, it's about alignment of cash flows, right? And, you know, it, fundamentally we were trying to do diligence. Part of it, like you said, is, you know, I love the point um, that you know, Andrew is making about, you know, what are the policies and how do they filter through? You know, some of the best experiences going on a site visit is just walking into the villages with the sales agents and yeah. just watching how they go through the process, how they communicate with the customer and it's really great when you start, you know, one day, you know, you're at the headquarters or talking to, with the C-suite of a company and they're saying, this is how things are supposed to work. And they've given you these great PDFs of all the policies, you know, that's all wonderful, but sit there with the yeah. call center team, you know, listen in on the calls, see how it's going or, you know, walk the ground with the sales team, go into a customer's house and just, you know, observe. And you know, as much as you're having this random visit with everyone's like, oh, it's the investor, you know, as much as people can let me be a fly on the wall, um, and just see how that translates. And you could see a, a stronger team means that these lessons, especially because these companies are always evolving, right? So if things are, they're changing or upgrading their policy, how much is that really filtered down to the line management and the, the front, you know, the front line staff that actually interacts with customers. And the other piece that maybe a higher level is around you know, diligence on what I'd say fundamentally is the inner economics. Because how efficient they are at collecting on their contract you know, there's people ask me what number do you need to see, and it, it really depends. Yeah, it depends on their financing structure, when they're what other you know, debt or obligations they have, when those come due, how their orders work from their suppliers, and all that. Because fundamentally, the asset finance you front the money in the cycle, right? You have to take cash up front to order your product, whether it's motorcycles, solar home systems, pumps, whatever it is. You need to pay for that up front from whoever is making that product. That it's going to be a time lag for that to get produced, distributed, sh you know, shipped, distributed, especially mm -hmm. now with some of the supply chain disruptions. And you're not making any money on that investment. It's just <laughs> waiting. That's just dead time that you've got to you know, carry that cost. Then it takes time to distribute, sale, get it to the customer. And if we take you know, Payco Solar, for example, there's going to be a small deposit made at the point at the time of sale. And then typically you probably need somewhere from anywhere, let's say 55 to 65% of the con the on paper contract period, you know, if everything goes perfectly um, to cover your cost of sale, including you know, the cost of the goods, the distribution costs, the upfront commission that might be given to a sales agent in a lot of these processes, you know, sticking with the Pago solar example. So there's a huge you know, gap between when you've put out the money to buy the product to when you've actually recovered that money and then on top of that, years in some cases, right? Just it, so the exactly, audience understands what you're talking about. Which is why it lends itself to, to debt. I mean, because you're going to buy an asset, it's going to produce cash over time. So it's like bring that investment forward and earn on it. But that also means you've got to, when you have to pay that debt, better align well with when you're actually going to generate that cash from the assets. And yeah. we know the benefit of a pay go model has often been the flexibility relative to, say, sort of shorter term um, MFI loans that are very, very strict on the timelines. But that also means you need to have a certain amount of track record and some experience so that there is in the aggregate predictability in the cash flows from, from that portfolio. And that's where we get, you know, now we get pretty deep into people's raw payment data, work with them to really understand what the payment curve looks like. And if we're going to do an analysis working with the company, we're going to want to try and sculpt the debt repayments to us around what that actual cash cycle looks like. Right. Otherwise, things can get very messy. Um, and you also want to try to have things that naturally adjust. You know, if you put a lot of money up front with the assumption they're going to do great sales and everything's going to be fine, that's great. Totally and don't. then you can have a worldwide pandemic and suddenly sales right. slow down. 
everything, you know, and even if your portfolio collections are great, the volume assumptions aren't there for all like justifiable reasons, but your, your debt hasn't changed, right? right? So it's, you know, trying to have some of that flexibility. You know, we were founded uh, around this idea that this is actually a commercial sector. It can be scalable, it can grow, it's financeable. And we want to get it and show and debt financing was going to be critical. So we were one of the first movers coming in offering debt financing. And, you know, we've adjusted, we've learned because again, building on what Andrew just said, if we want to address issues of an access, financial inclusion, poverty, and just opportunity and job creation um, in, in all these markets, you can't do it the same way it was always done. But ultimately, I think as a debt lender, we want to evolve it in a way so that it looks a lot like the way it's done elsewhere, because that's also how you bring in the massive you know, institutional capital that's needed. So we just have yeah. to, you know, prove it and build a track record, um, ultimately evolving to structures that are more conventional. Yeah, as you said, financial sustainability is turtles all the way down too, right? We need everyone at every level of that to be sustainable. Um, again, an unfair amount of time to chat with both of you, but I did want to make sure I asked, looking at the, at the company level, and maybe Andrew, we'll start with you. What practices have really jumped out to you as, as strong practices in risk management? And you know whether that's assessing the customer or managing the loan cycle, or even on, you know, the collections and repossession end of it. Is there anything yeah. that's really jumped out with you? And and do you do anything to share that across your portfolio? Definitely, we do. So one thing that has like, jumped out for me from last year is one of our companies in West Africa that we invested in that has seeing their portfolio risk, which is a key KPI that everybody tracks in terms of how well you're doing, has always been very low and has come down over time. And even last year with the pandemic, their I mean, the portfolio risk 30 days came down further. And one of the practices I think it did, leading to what one of the, I think, experts mentioned, the incentive around sales, which allow, which makes people sort of push sales even at the expense of uh, proper risk management. And what this company did was to sort of have a, what I call a carrot and a stick approach, right? So yes, when a sale is recorded, um, agents and sales staff and sales supervisors get rewarded. But for every write-off that eventually happens, that cost is shared across the sales um, sort of channel. So all the way from the sales supervisor down to the agent, Obviously, the company also takes some of the cost of that write-off, but they try to share like 50% across those responsible for sales. So what that has done over years is that sales supervisors or agents not only are interested in pushing sales, but monitoring to ensure that people are paying on time hmm. and are good clients. Because you know, for every default or every write-off that happens, they're going to also pay or be held liable from an economic perspective for that. So people are not only just pushing sales. Yes, they push sales, but they're also monitoring the portfolio and monitoring those clients that are late, those who are overdue to follow up with them to make sure that at least with constant sort of monitoring. And at, and at the same time, I think it also sort of determines who they sell to, how they assess yeah. the customer at the beginning. Because you know that if you just bring in customers for the sake of bringing in customers and meeting your sales target, and eventually it will, to bite you down the, low, like down the line. So that is a practice that we've seen that, that has worked well for this company. And it's something we've, we've tried to share across the portfolio with other companies in our yeah. space. That's interesting too. So they actually have a real downside risk there. Um, and uh, that's, that's what, in an innovative way, it's a powerful sort of counter incentive to growth or to reckless growth, I guess would be the better way of putting it. Um, yeah, Avi, what, what's really jumped out to you and, and how much are you able to sort of diffuse that across your portfolio? I mean, I think it, piggybacking what Andrew was talking about is how do the incentives track within an organization? Yeah. Yeah. Ultimately, it's the best way not to you know, have to deal with write-off is not to make a bad loan in the first place, which is, right. of course, easier said than done. But one thing, like you said, with the runaway growth, not having those incentives, and having incentives for growth with, you know, good, um, good customers, good loans, uh, and so on. So, is the sales agent force, you know, are they sort of regional or localized? Also, beyond that, how well do they know their community? You know, a good example is a company I was you know, doing diligence on in Southern Africa. We're part of it, 
they were, most of their customer base were smallholder farmers. Um, and so were the agents. So when they came to assess the customer's ability to pay, when they were from the community, so they probably already were somewhat familiar with whatever side hustles that their clients had. And on top of that, they could look at the client's fields and have a pretty good sense of, well, they've got this much, they're growing these crops, and that's gonna earn them this much at these times of year. So it gave them a very sort of instinctive idea of what the cash flows were of their customers going in. Whereas we've seen companies, you know, there's been a trend to that localization because companies originally just had agents who would sell whenever to wherever, and you couldn't necessarily service a customer that your agent, you know, happened to sell an extra unit to while they were on vacation or you know, far from home, never to be in that part of the country again. <laughs> so how well managed and tracked the sales force is that sort of discipline and how they do that um, is really important. The incentive alignment is important. And that's just kind of, you know, the bottom up pieces and that all goes to how well, how in touch is management, especially when you're dealing with a com company operating across multiple countries with what's happening locally. Yeah. We get nervous if you've got, you know, senior management and all decision making is far away. Um, I'm so sorry, Avi. I'm probably going to have to, mm -hmm. to ask you to pause there, but thank you both so much. I mean, for these answers, obviously we can continue this discussion for another 40 minutes easily. Um, I just want to say a huge thank you. I realize we're time and quite a few people have stayed through us all the way to the end. Everyone on here is available to reach out to and chat with, particularly our risk experts are there for this reason to consult on these questions. I'd love to have more of these discussions with our investors and our risk managers. I'd also just like to personally say a huge thank you to everyone at CGAP who supported this work from Alexander mm -hmm. Sotoriu, Max Mattern, um, Nikki Kaki, and, and, and Sai Kumaraswamy, as well as Javier Faz. This has been a, a quite a long labor of love, and we're looking forward to putting out this credit risk management guide, sharing it, and continuing this discussion, and getting more asset finance sustainably and responsibly out there in the world. So. To everyone who's participated, Walter, Isaac, Holger, Allison, Rodney, uh, Andrew, and Avi, thank you very much. And to everyone who's listened, have a wonderful day. Stay connected.